welcome to the Spirit Sessions podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love soundbite. Join us where I'll help you find your true spiritual home, where every single aspect of you is holy ground. Hi everyone, Katie here. This podcast is intended to inspire you, educate you, and most importantly, support you on your journey towards knowing who you really are, that inner self, that inner teacher. I am not a psychologist or a medical doctor and do not offer professional health or medical advice on this podcast. If you are suffering from any kind of psychological or medical issue, Please do the right thing and seek help from your qualified health professional. So there's this amazing thing that I'm starting to realize for myself, and that is that this thing we call our life and this evolving healing journey really is never done. I think something super magical starts to happen, especially when we're talking about Ayurveda, this path to crafting and creating a life that has as much beauty and purpose as possible, it's really important to remember that you are not a project to be solved and you're not a problem to be fixed. That is really what we're all about over here at the Shakti School and at Ayurveda School specifically. Now, of course, we're going to give you all of the amazing tips, tricks, and tools to have a great life and to feel amazing. But more importantly, we're going to offer you space space to connect to yourself and the divinity that lives within. That is why I am so excited to announce that we have an early bird special happening right now. You guys, it ends September 30th. After that, prices go up by $500. So get in before the end of September. You can also book a call with a graduate who will answer any of your questions so you can gain clarity and see if this program is right for you. We're going to put a link to book that in the show notes. Lastly, we have a special gift for you, dear podcast listener. The best way we can reach new listeners is through you. And so if you love this podcast, please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and take a screenshot of your review. And guess what? If you send it to info at the shaktischool.com. When we get that screenshot review, we will send you a special gift. Yes, it's a secret. It's a special gift. It's going to come to you in the mail from yours truly. And I can't wait to share that gift with you. I'll give you a clue. It may or may not be something straight out of 1998. Uh, another hint, it's a CD. All right, guys. And now on to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Katie Silcox. This is Spirit Sessions. We have a really special program for you all today. This is actually the first time that I've ever had two guests on at once. We have an incredible offering today. We have the amazing Kimberly Johnson, friend of the podcast, back. She is the founder of so many things. She's a somatic experiencing practitioner, the author of the book Call of the Wild, sexological body worker, podcaster, mama, and you know, I'll just add this into the bio, sort of a revolutionary force that I find to be quite brave and inspiring to me. And we also have Stephen Jenkinson, new friend of the pod, and um He is a worker, author, storyteller, and cultural activist. He's the co-founder of the Orphan Wisdom School. He has a master's degree from Harvard University in theology and the University of Toronto in social work. Um, I'll get into this in a moment, but he's written several books. One of them I have right here called Die Wise. I'm currently working uh, through my own slight obsession with death. So this feels like a very timely offering and i'm just so happy to have both of you on we're going to talk about your new offering called redemption 
Kimberly and Stephen, welcome. Welcome to Spirit Sessions. You're very welcome. Thank you, too, for the invite. I should just, at the beginning, offer a little bit of uh, courtesy by way of a correction. It's not called redemption. That's way too early. Oh. It's called reckoning. Oh, reckoning. Where did I get redemption? We'll find out. That's so weird because I have written down reckoning. And when I read it out, I said redemption. So maybe there's something here for us. Oh, oh I'd say so. Well, guys, I, I just want to kind of give a little bit of a frame for our audience that may not be familiar with what sort of went down. I think it was at least six months to a year ago when I heard a podcast that you did, Kimberly, with Stephen. And I remember exactly where I was. I was in my backyard. And I was hearing this interview, which took on so many of the salient topics that were on my heart at the time. It was such a raw interview. It was so emotional. I'm not going to say it's it's um, uncommon for me to share a tear, shed a tear, but I was covered in tears at the end of this podcast. And I know this has been a really popular podcast for you guys. The topics were around collectivism and individuality, this sense of a, a loss or a lack of eldership in our world and a deep polarization that all of us were feeling at the time, socioculturally. And Kimberly, you just put your finger on a number of places that had really been on my own heart as someone who, you know, is, is attempting to have a, a positive impact in the world. And so you had a conversation that later led to more conversations, but I think for our audience, frame it for us. What what went down in this very special podcast that led to you guys developing more of a, a working relationship together? Uh, well, it was definitely an extreme coalescence of moments in August of 2021. So right now we're talking in August of 2022. And um, I had just been dealing with a number of things that were all seemed to be happening in rapid succession much more quickly than prior. So losing friendships, um, that was a really hard one for me. I've never been very good at endings. Um, so, and losing friendships for reasons that didn't seem like they needed to be lost. Uh, feeling pressured on two ends of a spectrum. So when my last book came out, Call of the Wild on the far left was, I was saying that female nervous systems heal differently than male nervous systems. And so was getting a lot of heat for using the word female and using the word woman. And, you know, I, I gave a class for 500 people and I didn't even get two minutes into my presentation before the, the host let people come off mute and sort of give me lessons on my language and how I was speaking. And I was aware of the language I was using and I was choosing to use it, but people assumed that I was ignorant and that's why I was using the language I was using. And then on the other side, I was reported to some of my certifying boards for my work being in quotes, close to prostitution and putting several of the people who've trained me and their credentials uh, under scrutiny for being willing to work with me. So I was feeling a lot of pain professionally and personally and understanding also as a mom, um, my daughter had been in online school for some combination of 18 months. At that point, I'd moved across the country, moved back, uh, you know, just experienced a lot of the migratory patterns that many people experienced during the pandemic, um, experiencing a lot of loss and, and fracturing and feeling like people that I used to share common ground with, I didn't feel like I did anymore, but not wanting to give up on those people, but at the same time, not knowing exactly where to put my effort what, you know, if I want to put my quote unquote money where my mouth is, like what were the actions that I should take to do that? And so I undertook a project to try to 
zoom out of this obsession at the time, which was vaccine, no vaccine. Do you believe in the virus? Do you not believe in the virus to try to make it a more human conversation? And in that process, I realized I, I couldn't do that because I didn't want that to become my part-time job or maybe even full-time job um, around a topic that, you know, I'm, I'm not really that interested in pathology. I'm not really that interested in vaccines. I'm interested in humane conversations and civil disobedience and civil obedience sometimes. Uh, so at that point, my good friend, Matthew Stillman, who's been a scholar at Orphan Wisdom School and um, been a friend of Stephen Jenkinson for a long time, suggested that I speak with him. And so that was the context for our first conversation. So I came to it already with a fair amount of undoneness, and then I became more undone, which I guess most people would think would be a bad thing. But something rang true in a way that was very, you could categorize like if, if we talk about death, for instance, and we could say, oh, well, in Buddhism, we talk about impermanence or in Hinduism, we talk about samskaras. Uh, there was just something different that was happening that was upending a lot of my underlying frameworks that I understood to be uh, closer to the core mm -hmm. and also just closer to what might be my own inheritance. Mm -hmm what uh, what really rang true for me and resonated was this idea of grief and becoming heartbroken as a path and personally allowing myself to stay open to my heartbreak and kimberly i understand your story so much right and Stephen, you you have said seeing things your way is not that big of an achievement, but being willing to be heartbroken together while not being in agreement, I think leads me to this place that Kimberly touched on of this sense of our time and the polarization and speak to me about being heartbroken together and being in a place of non agreement together as a path. I'm not sure if I plugged in the as a path part of things. That might be your contribution that's to the notion. That's my addition. Yeah, I thought so. I recognized, I disrecognized that part. <laughs> so I'm not sure it's a path myself. But then again, I'm not that big or that good at paths. The If the understanding of path is a way out mm -hmm. or even a way in, or frankly, even a way. I, I'm, th I'm thinking that, you know, heartbreak is... I mean, it has a lot of, it would appear to have a lot of downside on the surface, number one. Number two, you know, downside has no upside. Not really. I mean, we know there's apologists for it, but, you know, you always say, don't try this at home, heartbreak, right? So at the end of the day, you begin to realize that the regime of self-care is a citadel of intolerance, really. That's the way it strikes me. Um, if you if you just imagine aloud from whence comes your uh, sense of well-being, does it come from a chronic experience of well-being? In other words, if things go well, are you a model citizen? Are you qualified? Are you are you of any use to the rest of us if your shit's going well? Generally speaking, I think we could be in agreement that a certain admixture of mayhem contributes to your your capacity to genuinely give a shit. I mean, but in an engaged fashion, right? Number one, and that you don't need a tremendous amount of education on the matter of uh, disillusionment or discouragement. In other words, if you're going to be in the trenches, you want you want you don't want to be there with an amateur, not really. And and people who look on the bright side are a bit amateurish in a time like the one we're in, I think. And so, um, you know, I'm I find myself in a strange position of advocating heartbreak as a uh, as a mandate for citizenship not as a mandate for being okay uh, if i may I'll, I'll just tell you a brief story on the matter of being okay yes. so in the in the days before i came to my senses and and got into a, a failure called farming which is what i'm in now i lived downtown downtown toronto and i was living in, in this hilarity called a semi what's it called semi-detached 
<laughs> There's no semi-detached, man. It's like semi-pregnant. There's no, you're not semi-detached. You're completely detached uh, on one side and utterly attached on the other side. And so, and I had a, a kind of lunatic, uh, lapsed Lutheran clergywoman as one neighbor. Uh-oh, that's probably not going to go too well. And on the other side, on the other side of the alleged um, shared driveway that nobody was allowed to use, were, were born again Italian Catholics in their 60s. So karma, maybe, I don't know. And one day I just, I was looking out the window and this is the first time people were talking seriously about the notion of a drought. So this is going back a ways now. And the, the reservoirs up north of the city were starting to, which is no news to people in California, but way up north here, that was, that was absolutely brand new. And which is to say, nobody knew the etiquette, not really, not even the emotional etiquette of drought. So I'm watching this fella, and, and this is already a, a given that we're in this condition. And he's out there with his hose, power washing the driveway. He's a born again, convert, converted and convicted Catholic with a, with a leg up on all things moral and ethical and religious and spiritual. I'm not I'm saying that, he said that, he said it more than once. He knew I was fallen and beyond repair, you see. But I'm watching him uh, power wash the driveway. And power washing the driveway wasn't enough. He had to power wash it all the way down to the street, which was a considerable way. And then that wasn't enough either. He had to power wash the gutter till it went to the, to the sewer uh, grate. And, so, and I'm watching this going, then he power washes his, his lawn. And here's what I thought. You see, they think this is a peon to intolerance on my part. And you're not wrong. But I thought as I watched him do it, I thought to myself, what does your green lawn mean in a drought? What does it mean? Not is it right or wrong? I mean, let, leave that to the amateurs. But this is a deeper question. What, is it, what does it mean? What have you opted for? What have you decided you have no answerable position on? This kind of thing, yeah? And this is, although it might sound like a stretch, this is how I imagine being okay for the sake of survival. That in a time like this where survival is, in, frankly, is overrated as an achievement, that the, period, the, the times that we're in should reasonably score you in both senses of the term, in terms of scarification, but in terms of, of, of the tone and tempo of your days, yeah? Then you being okay for prolonged periods of time seems to set you at odds with the criteria of citizenship. At least that's the way it strikes me. So, so heartbreak is, is Morse code for everything I just said. And the notion that the best way to elude heartbreak is to have less heart mm. seems to follow, you see. So the only way to advocate, advocate more heart in the matter of being a citizen of a troubled time is to cop to the obvious, which is that will let you in for more heartbreak, not less, which would be known in other times and places as ca cal cardio calisthenics. Kimberly, did you want to add something? Uh, I don't have anything to add to that, but I do have, you know, a lot of questions and wonderings. Um, so this morning, my daughter's birthday was on Friday. And this morning I had six girls over here and a new puppy. And, um, you know, a lot of my daughter's friends have been either in the psych ward or um, medicated. And it's their parents aren't, they don't want to do that. Their parents aren't excited about doing that. Their parents are trying to do what they know how to do to avoid that but that's where it's ending up and so I'm you know I've been I've been Stephen Jenkinson and I have been in conversation for about a year now and all the heartbreak doesn't come so hard to me but I know that when people listen it's like okay well what's the difference between being heartbroken and then just being able to go on with your life. What's the difference between, and maybe in my generation, I still have enough momentum. I still have enough 
you know, I've already lived in a country where people don't believe that anything they do really makes a difference because the government's so corrupt that they just feel like any kind of action doesn't really change anything. And I came in with my idealism as a American and a, you know, with a decent education and someone who was taught that what I do makes a difference. Uh, but it's it's a hard, I I was kind of letting them sleep in a little bit. And then I thought, I can tell that anytime I tell them something, like they they want to learn, they want to, they they have a feeling that things are not okay, but they don't know the questions to ask. They don't know, you know, they, and they're like shocked anytime I like make food for them. I'm like, well, I think that's kind of partially like my job right now, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a question or an answer. It's just that I'm, I'm living in the center of what it means to hold the heartbreak and try to move on and not move on, but move forward, you know, con continue to make actions that all feel very imperfect and um, not very, I don't know if long lasting is the right word, but it's hard, it's hard as an individual to get deep down into the soil, into the root system, one by one, you know? You know, uh, when you guys spoke about elderhood and grieving, I, when I was younger, I, I thought myself very clever for coming up with a term I called elder rage. And when I was a young woman, I felt a lot of anger at my elders, my my parents, my grandparents, because they didn't teach me stuff. And then as I kind of, I hope, have moved more into my own heart, I started to feel grief that my mom didn't get taught by her mom. And I started to really learn about what life was like for my grandmother in the 1950s in her little teeny tiny kitchen you know that that was her whole reality and and there was just this sense and still is in me that that there's like a topsy-turvy world that we're living in where you know i know my mom hi mom vera she's gonna listen to this podcast because she listens to all of them and she's saying i'm learning so much about what it means to be you know, a, a woman, I'm learning about how to feed myself. I'm learning about herbs. I'm learning about all these things that you young girls are bringing out. And I'm, and on one hand, I'm overjoyed that my mom is learning all of what I consider very lost indigenous and eldership traditions. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm sad that I feel like the old woman in my family of older women, right? And so maybe, Stephen and, and Kimberly, can you guys speak to, am I, am I wrong on this feeling of like a, a lot, I felt your longing, Kimberly, in that podcast, I, I could be wrong, but I felt this longing that I have, which is I, I want eldership, and I feel like I'm being called to be an elder, and yet I don't feel ready, you know, and so Stephen, can you speak to that, am I, is there a topsy-turvy world that we're living in? You wouldn't ask if it weren't so. <laughs> right. You know, I've heard many times on the subject of elderhood, not that it comes up very often as, an, as a distinct uh, object of inquiry. Mm. And maybe that's proper, but the fact that it disappears without a trace maybe isn't. But when it does come up, it's often talked about in terms of it's a negotiable, fluid, and infinitely available capacity that floats uh, liberally and democratically across all the generations, washing them in indistinct levels of mutual competence and regard. Really. That's what that ability is. It just, it fixes itself to anywhere all the time. This, look, this is not to disqualify the capacities of younger people, number one, nor is it to qualify uncritically and automatically the alleged inherent qualifications of an older person, mm -hmm. which is far from a given, right? Just as you've acknowledged, when, when people you look to to be elders were themselves never eldered, which is the situation you are in. I don't mean personally, but certainly generationally, you are there, right? The institution of elderhood in Anglo-North America 
has not been available as a functioning institution for a good period of time. There's no living memory across the culture of a time when it was otherwise. That's a very important observ observation to make. This is what it sounds like when you don't make it. So I'm, I'm in Oaxaca. I'm finishing the book about elderhood called Come of Age. And I'm in a bar, which never happens, not then and certainly not now. But I'm in a bar and uh, there's a woman who's maybe 33, I'm going to say. Uh, and she, she actually approaches me, which is already I'm going, huh, because I've been, needless to say, out of the game for a long time. Right. But anyway, so very idle chatter with insanely loud music, which some people listening may be used to. I'm not one of them. So she says, so what do you do now? I think to myself, is that a real question? And being not completely jaded on the subject, I took it to be a real question, which I, in retrospect now I realized was naive. But at the time, I engaged it as a real question in good faith which makes me the dupe, I should say, not the superior you know, person. And so <laughs> I told her, well, I'm working on this book about elderhood actually. And I thought, well, that sounds vaguely interesting as an opening gambit. I was the only one who thought so though. She said, <laughs> she literally said in this tone of voice, I'll see if I can inhabit it. She said, why oh. like that? Like an idiot, I thought that was a question too. And so I went about answering the question. Well, I said, in, in earnestness, you know, this is kind of puppy dog pathetic now, but at the time I did my best. I said, well, you know, I think, I figured something happened to older people on the way to elderhood. I didn't get the whole sentence out of my mouth. She waved me off like this. Oh, she said, I know what happened. How, we, how can we be 19 seconds into an encounter between two strangers? And she's so sure 19 seconds in about this. Well, obviously, we've both hit a nerve somewhere, somehow. I know what happened, she said. Elderhood abandoned people your age. Pause. We've got it now. So, again, I'll say it. This is not what I'm saying is not designed to repudiate in any way the capacities of younger people to marshal themselves on behalf of a better day and to think an, a sane and better thought on the subject. Absolutely not. But that's not what elderhood is. It's not just being able to conceive of a better day. Elderhood, it seems to me, is the willingness and the capacity to inhabit the, the debris, the diminishment the how did it get like this part of the equation, not the here's what we do about it part of the equation, which is much easier to inhabit, frankly. Because if you're going to inhabit the, my God, how did it get like this part of things, and you happen to be my age or older, there's a guarantee here, and this is what it is. Considering these things is the same thing as mea culpa. Mm. It is, has to be part of it, mm. you know? On my watch, when we had optimal opportunity, as, as Kimberly said earlier, to have consequence in this world. Most more than not, we're engaged in a degree of self-promotion that was designed to optimize on the income generating years, yeah? Or some version of that. Successful or otherwise, that was a big part of the program. And we are where we are largely because people of my age were being all they could be. EGADs, okay? So I'm suggesting here now that the function of elderhood is to exhibit, embody, and not repudiate poverty and diminishment and the utter collapse of potential. And finally, you become something like actual for the people who are disinclined for the actual. So you become a, a kind of agitated alternative to being a better self in case people want to know how did it get like this that they don't have to look any further for the moment than an encounter with you and i'm not saying you have the explanation i am saying you are manifest you are a manifest incarnation of 
how it got like this. Hmm. We're kind of wicked job description, no? Yeah, I mean, it makes me think about my mom saying, you know, I did a I did a podcast on Botox and the way that it actually alters the capacity not only for the person receiving the facial micro movements to understand the emotion of the person offering up the emotion, but it also alters the emotional state of the person themselves. And so you get this total mismatch between a connection, you know, because of these micro movements of the face, they're really important. Mm. And my mom said, you know, we're from the South. And she said, well, I just, I'm not doing it, even though all my friends are getting Botox because somebody's got to have the old face somebody has to have the old face and i just thought my mom has these explosive moments of such wisdom and i thought there's such a a beauty in being the one that will and i think that touches perhaps on what you're saying of like this is what it looks like somebody's got to look their age somebody has to look their age because if nobody looks their age what is their age supposed to look like anymore? Mm. And the idea suddenly is because it's a life option. You could look your age, but you have no obligation to. I submit to you, along with what you've just said, that if you're an older person, you have an obligation to younger people to look your age and to credit that look. You see, not apologize for it, not rouge it up, inhabit it entirely, not necessarily with pride, just with a willingness to cop to the fact that you've been around for a while. Because if you start cherry picking what being around for a while is supposed to look like and feel like and do like, what do you end up with? Just a, a shopping list of upside. But that's not what being older than you were is. It's not a shopping list of upside. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a willingness to be in reality to be to be real to contribute to reality mm -hmm. yeah so um another theme that felt important to me was this idea uh i think you said it correct me if i'm wrong stephen the quote from Jung about I'd rather be whole than than good. And be good, yeah. And I'm fascinated by Jung. I'm currently in a PhD program in depth psychology. I mean, I'm I'm so interested in this idea of individuation. And there seems to be a tension of opposites playing out, and maybe I'm not understanding it correctly, between this in this experience of being a human individual and the collective and the relationality and the ability to be differentiated and yet interconnected with one another. And I find personally, and you know, I have listened to Kimberly a lot and read all her books and we've never met in human form, but I feel like we're friends. And um, there's this tension between the loneliness, the real genuine loneliness that I feel on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm single, I don't have any kids. And I'm like, you know what? It makes sense that I want to watch television while I'm eating this meal. It's like a proxy for a person. And of course, with COVID and the lockdowns that just intensified. Yeah. And, I, and in fact, that loneliness has been such a portal for me into such a sweet place, you know, and I've really been working with loneliness. And in, in that sense of being alone and therefore, you know, isolated, can you help me and the listeners navigate this realm of individuality vis-a-vis -vis collectivism? And are they mutually exclusive? And perhaps we need collectivism to actually arrive at an individuation. And that's what I'm hopeful for, that they're not mutually exclusive, in fact. Right. They're required. Uh, I'm going to ask Kimberly to refresh my memory on on a Portuguese phrase that she made available to me the other day. Do you know the one I mean? 
sozinho a gente não vale nada. Uh, something like we're not worth anything alone. Okay. It's a bit of a rough ride. You'll admit that that declaration, but it's not without its merit as a description, not advocacy, description. Okay. And this is from a place that's probably a little bigger on the collective life than we might be here. So let, let me see what I can do. And then let me uh, cede the floor to Kimberly on the matter. I think this is an absolutely arbitrary and artificial distinction to make between individual and collective. It's just, it's, I'm not ascribing that to you, of course. You're not, you didn't invent it. But it's absolutely, from a kind of psychic labor point of view, a lazy take on things. It's easily satisfied, no? Okay. So, I mean, who invented the notion of an individual? Has that been like around forever? And I think all of us instinctively know the answers. Probably not. Hopefully not. It hasn't been around forever. I mean, if you think about the practice of portraiture in the early Enlightenment period, and you watch how they rendered children, one of the things they did was made sure that the kids look like the parents, complete with whiskers and crazy stuff like this, or shadow at least. So what's going on there? And the answer is, well, they saw kids as mini adults. There was no such thing as childhood in the way we understand the term at all. Not only that, but they're getting themselves ready for the inevitable degree of infant mortality that ensued in that period. Yeah. So they're waiting it out for the frailties of childhood to lapse. Same thing with individualism, in my humble estimation. We could say it differently. We have, for a considerable period of time now, flirted with the notion that we're individuals. How's it working? There's a certain amount of uh, weather in the system that's available to us. There's a certain amount of history, consequence washed up on shore. How's it working? Because the alternative is, oh my God, we're all going to look the same like the Chinese. Is that it? Because that, that's, that's a historical fear. I remember hearing about it. We just all look the same. The same Mao outfit and the same hat and you know all of that sort of thing. As if we've crafted a legitimate, ongoing, and preferable alternative called lonely together. So you know the, the or Orphan Wisdom School's principal patron saint, Mr. Leonard Cohen, bless his bones, came up with something like this. It doesn't get better than this. He said, baby, let's get married. We've been alone too long. Let's be alone together. Let's see if we're that strong. Let's do something crazy, something absolutely wrong while we're waiting for the miracle to come. That's honest. Let's be alone together. No, People who are alone together are more fond, typically, of their individualism than they are of togetherness. And it's a, it's a savage season indeed when you've crafted a circumstance in which you somehow have to choose or allegedly compromise one to have some, you know, experience of the other. No, I, I mean, I'll leave it at this seems to me that your ability to be a citizen is not an individual uh, individuation event. Being a citizen, by definition, means you're, you have a, a willingness to submit in the, uh, in, the, in the discipline understanding of the term submit. Not disappear. Simply understand that your capacity to be and for your life to achieve meaning is really fundamentally available to you as a consequence of the willingness of other people to agree to your existence mm. and to live their lives as if you were so. Yeah. Kimberly, what do you think? What was just, what I was just thinking about was how many of us have a lot of sensitivities, right? Especially people listening to Katie's podcast and people that are into yoga. It's like, 
we all have all these sensitivities of what we can eat and how much noise we can tolerate and how many people can be around and we're sensitive to everybody's energies. And I was thinking about how that's, we think that the way to handle that is to change the environment so that the environment, we can adapt to the environment, but perhaps that's the interface of exactly what we're talking about is the absence of more contact and more, uh, I, I, in the people who come to me are really looking for skills to adapt themselves so that they feel better to continue doing whatever they're doing, even though everyone's got the small farm fantasy. I mean, that's, that's ubiquitous now. That's like every country in the, like all the Brazilians are thinking about having a small farm too. Um, but there's something about this. We, we have the situation we're in, you know, I live in a two bedroom apartment with my daughter and each of us agree that we do much better when there's more people around. And I just noticed in Brazil that I would, I was just there for two months. I would wake up in the morning and I could feel that my mood was about, like I was about to feel kind of go down, go inward. And then there were just other people there. So there's just other things happening. There were other people to talk to. There were other things going on other than me and my internal world and however it is my intestines were feeling and whatever other thing was on my mind that was going to occupy my attention and it's such a simple thing it seems like but in the context that most of us live in North America to construct a living situation where we would share living space that's outside of family or romance is just an extremely difficult challenge and so yeah I mean we have to do our best in that situation but also I mean I'm really living the challenge right now because I have this new puppy and I don't know anything about animals. I mean, it's like ridiculous. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing at all other than, you know, I wrote a book on wild animals, but a domestic animal is a whole other thing, but I'm living the limits. And I, and also with my daughter, like, she's like, I'm going to go to the beach. Great. Okay. So who's taking care of the puppy while you're at the beach? Uh, She's like, well, I don't think the puppy will like the beach. Yeah, the puppy can't go to the beach. So that means someone has to take care of the puppy while you're gone. Yeah. And there's so much overcompensating that I've done because I think that's what, you know, this thing that Stephen Jenkinson says about our children deserve less than we've had is like, it's so built in us to give our children more than we've had, whether that's more emotional attunement or more opportunities or, you know, whatever the more is for each person that what does it mean for me to tell her, yeah, I know it's like your birthday weekend, but I actually can't take care of your dog, the dog you wanted uh, right now. And it's a small thing, but it's also, you know, I had a big party for her. Okay, well, who's cleaning up after the party? Me and my friends. And like, to what extent is it like, okay, yes, it's your party, but you also help clean up. And I'm noticing how in my mind, it's so weird, but it feels like I'm giving a punishment when actually this is just what it means to live together. Like it's, there's no kind of a punishment. It's just like, there's stuff to clean up. We have to do it. It's not like you're, I'm making you do something. No, I'm teaching you how to live and be a human so that you actually can be a contributing part. And you're also not just living in your inner world, analyzing your you know, ups and downs of your every emotional and like, you know, social interaction. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I spent 20 years studying Eastern psychology, Kimberly and I've had really similar paths and then Ayurvedic medicine, which is very beautiful, you know, and so much of the Ve the Vedas, these early earliest of human religious texts are not about getting kundalini to go up your spine and you know awaken yourself as an individual but they're really learning how to walk together in peace talk together in peace be together it's all about rituals around community building and i consider Thich Nhat Hanh one of my teachers who talks about the reality of our interdependence with everything it's not a practice it's just actuality that we are intimately woven into one another and um I had a really wonderful elder mentor to, to me the other day say, you know, I think the next stage in your journey might be for you to um, explore volunteering. And I was like, 
immediately felt scared, right? Like I have so much to do. How am I going to add this one other thing? And, but I, I, I felt a calling in my heart that, that, that rang true, you know, and I felt really called to work with older, older folks. And I got on a call, an interview with this volunteer agency here in Charlottesville. And I got on the Zoom with her and she was 70 some years old and just this beautiful woman. And she had such a slow cadence of voice. And there's just, just in this one Zoom call with someone who my ego, my you know career, it had nothing to do with anything that what culture has taught me is important. And this one conversation just radically actually gave back so much to me. And she was saying, you know, one of the things that we would ask you to do is just is just to do these friendly visits. And there are people in our community that are really isolated. They may not see anyone ever. And so just having you go over there once a week and see if they need a light bulb changed or you could pull some weeds or maybe go pick them up something at the grocery. I mean, she's listing and she said, and I said, well, sometimes I'm out of town. What do I do? And she's like, you can do a friendly call. I mean, even the names, you know, my heart's just breaking open. And I haven't started yet, but I'm going to start very soon. And just the idea of people being nearby me that are older, that are isolated. And I know so deeply what it feels like to feel lonely and isolated. It's like something magic started to happen from this one Zoom call that was just the interview to make sure I was like not a crazy person, you know? And there was a sense of being liberated from the tyranny of my own self-obsession as kimberly was saying these sort of vicissitudes of my own inner reality which i have a very strong connection to you know and it was it was like i haven't even started and i think there's probably some deep premise that you're not supposed to talk about the fact that you're volunteering but i i just i felt this massive expansion of my consciousness my heart i'm like lending my heart out to these elders in my community that I don't even know yet, like some sort of strange blind date that's going to happen in the future that I'm really excited about. And I'm thinking now, if I could experience this, it's hard to put words around, but this complete shift out of my own inner reality and my own self-obsession in one phone call, why aren't we all doing this all the time? Like, why is it I'm 42 and someone just said, hey, you should really volunteer right now. Um, can you speak to anything that, and I know there's not a solution, but I think, are, are there things that we can start to do that will both, I guess, I guess I'm wondering how we can course correct this lack of eldership and our reality and and also i'm i'm not an elder yet but but how can the younger generations connect to elders sure okay well i don't know and uh kimberly will will corroborate the fact that i'm not really the how-to guy um i i actually fundamentally mistrust the instinct to ask and to answer how-to questions. But if I'm forced to, and if I'm a good guest, which hopefully I could be here, then, and accede to the fact that the questions appeared, it could be this. I think it's a counterintuitive instinct here. The how-to questions are usually designed to dissolve the dilemma that gave them rise in the first place. Okay? Sure. Okay, so that's not my, my method, <laughs> if I have one. My method is to is to swear allegiance to the dilemma, right? And inhabit the dilemma and understand that if I was born to a troubled time and God knows I was, then I have to decide if that's an affliction that's personally born with a grudge or if that's an assignment that's personally born with something like devotion. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of tell which one I've decided. Just arbitrarily, I decided it's the second one for me. So. In the spirit of that understanding, I'd suggest something like this. 
you and I, the three of us, probably received some kind of mutually recognizable instruction in the manner of Thanksgiving, not the day or the weekend, the practice. And I'm going to go out on a limb here as an overture and suggest to you that, that being grateful, which I'm distinguishing from Thanksgiving, being grateful is a fundamental antidote to despair and depression. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's what I mean. So we're trained in Thanksgiving and the training typically and perhaps ungenerously as a characterization goes something like this. Say thank you. Okay. Why? Well, because because it's a nice thing to do. No, you're not walking around saying thank you all the time to everybody. So there's certain conditions that prompt thank you. And what are they? Almost uniformly when you're a kid, you're on the receiving end of something favorable. That's the precondition, right? Say thank you to the nice person because they gave you the whatever it is and like that. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, sure. But here's the dilemma. As you get a little older, you begin to discover that, first of all, that not all the world fits into nice stuff that comes to you. And as you get older still, you begin to realize it don't supposed to, as my teacher used to say. It's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be like it is, which is most of the human life range excludes stuff, the upside of life that you're waiting to detonate your capacity for Thanksgiving. In comes the capacity for gratitude instead. How does it work? At the risk of sounding like a formula, maybe it works something like this. You take the measure of things. You calibrate that most things are not designed to be upsided for you, nor are they supposed to be. You decentralize yourself from the scheme. That's one. Two, maybe you allow the fact that most stuff is not designed to satisfy you as being not cruel and unusual punishment, not betrayal, but actually the design which you are obliged as a grown-up to accommodate yourself to, not grudgingly put up with, accommodate yourself to, right? Until your heart is attuned to the fact that the world is not here to make sure that you're okay. It doesn't mean it's a cruel place. It means it's more than that. Okay, now, how does your gratitude appear? And the practice might be something like this. Can you be grateful for things that do not benefit you at all? but they're in the world, and by virtue of the mystery of the matrix of things, you submit to the mystery of it by being mystified and grateful and omitting the instinct to acknowledge personal uh, benefit by omitting the practice of thanks. So instead of saying thank you, you employ the, the web of gratitude, which is affirming rather than registering personal upside mm. that would be a cranky and uh inelegant in the early going but ultimately a rather radicalizing proposition i think i love it i'm i'm in let's do it <laughs> i'm super in <laughs> it's really beautiful this is really tracking just where i am personally with you know, one of my mentors was saying to me the other day, like here on earth, that's not the deal. The deal isn't you don't get to get all these great things that you want and had planned when you were writing in your journal as a 20 year old, you know, like this, this isn't the deal. And yet, if you can keep your heart, you know, in another way of saying that gratitude is like just continually not shutting my heart down. You know, just sort of keeping it open to what is actually happening, knowing that it, it, it's not all about me getting my comfort. And I think that's such an interesting juxtaposition that maybe Kimberly, you want to comment on around, you know, I had a neuroscientist on the other day who was saying like, one of the one of the key factors in how people who come back from war with PTSD are able to kind of get to a better place is this feeling of being safe. And and this 
idea of safety is is so sort of pervasive in a lot of the groups that Kimberly and I run in around this deep need for safety. And yet, like reality isn't safe and I don't, or it's not set up for your personal comfort and safety. And so negotiating and, and kind of being in this place of, um, I don't know, Kimberly, does that, does that ring for you at all? Like it, it's not set up for us to have this outer perfection of safety. And, and I, I get concerned that sometimes the things are rarely I'm on social media these days, but that I'm reading on Instagram or being misinterpreted that reality needs to somehow become a safe place for all of us to walk around in or otherwise it's not valid. I, yeah, I, I definitely would rather start from a place of assuming that it's not safe, um, assuming that it's all relative, relative degree of safety. I mean, it's hard. We're, there's, we can't really talk about all the layers at the same time. We can't really talk about psychology, spirituality, culture, mm -hmm. individual trauma renegotiation because each of those requires something a little bit different mm -hmm. but i don't know what's what i'm interested in and, and what's this is making me think about is just how we talk about choosing a life partner or a husband or a wife or a whomever in this culture and and how that person also has to live up to all of these standards and the list that we make and they're supposed to make us feel a certain way. And it, it seems that there's an absence of a, a third or maybe maybe multiplicity, maybe it's not just three, but it's a lot about, again, it's like, who am I and who is this person rather than what are, what are we doing together? Like what is, not even just what is the relationship, but what is the function of this junction? And that has a very different feeling to it. So when I hear younger people telling me about their dating or their relationships a lot of the time what they're describing to me is how this person isn't safe enough doesn't make them feel safe um all the things this person is not and the and and, and it's very stereotypical usually like this person's not masculine enough they don't let me relax into my feminine um i want to feel in my feminine more and so there's nobody that can really live up to like the the ideal of masculine that I have. So I just, I just noticed that, that there's um, the, the imprisonment of the notion of individualism and like preserving our individuality is at odds with being in partnership because in order to be in partnership, we will be changed and we must be changed. And maybe that's not so bad. Maybe that's not something that we should race it against, but something that we should move towards. But, you know, of course I have to put a disclaimer in all of my classes that because a lot of people come in and they're in abusive relationships. And I sometimes forget that there's actually, you know, that, that there's an extreme happening there. So obviously if you're getting demeaned, demoralized and injured in your relationship, then you should find a way to get out. But in the, I'm usually teaching to the 90% of people who are in relatively workable situations where Right. There is not cultural support of a relationship, which would the, ideally we would also be having relationship with godparents for the relationship and people who who we would be able to, and we wouldn't be looking for one person to satisfy all the functions because we would have rich friendships and we would have some kind of eldership and we would have responsibility not just to our children but to our extended children. You know, so there would be so many relationships that so much weight wouldn't be on that one, one thing. Mm -hmm. I would just offer a PS. If it's in the nature of your individualism to fear its borders, to fear its borders, and then secondarily to in almost an atavistic way to defend them, sooner or later it behooves the individual to wonder about the relative merits of their individualism. And if 
partnership, not my favorite word, but if the compromise to your individualism, which is another person, the limits upon your fantasy about what could be, that's called another person. If that's the consequence of it, it seems to me it behooves us all to reconsider <laughs> the allegation that you start off as an individual and that's where you should end and it should remain there throughout. And that your partnership is this there to augment your individualism. Mm. But surely to God, your partnership <clears throat> is another thing you could never have come up with on your own. Yeah. That's what I mean by the limits. It's the, it's the, it's the fundamental limit of your ability to be yourself. That's what being with somebody else is. I mean, I'm not expecting anybody to go along with that, but as a good host, a good guest, excuse me, that's, um, that's my little uh, offering I put on the table in, adv in, in advance of dinner. So um, you guys have a book coming out. What is the date, Kimberly? I think it's this week. August 16th. Can you tell us about your new book, Reckoning, which I've somehow renamed Redemption? <laughs> sure. Uh, the book is an introduction, which I wrote, and then transcripts of the conversations of the podcast, and then five ensuing conversations that we had over November and December of 2021. Mm -hmm. And then we each wrote a letter to one another that we didn't respond. We just hit send roughly around the same time. And uh, that's that's what the book is. It's a conversation book. Uh, you would think that just putting transcripts in a book wouldn't take too long, but actually we've been working on it for about six months, going over and over the conversations to make it um, readable and uh, the nuance that is there when we're live is different when you're reading it on a page. And I think the reason that we think it, the reason I think it's worth being a book is for the reasons that you mentioned of uh, being that we're in different generations and we come from really different training in some ways uh, that we're, <laughs> I can hear the puppy barking in the, in the other room now, um, <laughs> that, we're, I don't want to say modeling because we didn't set out to model anything for anyone. We set out to be ourselves and have a conversation and see what arose in, in becoming present to each of our faithfulness to the times. Uh, but we are in some ways coming together to have a conversation in um, that's less and less common to see. I think it was risky, to be honest, which is to say, I think it's a brave endeavor, which secondarily is to say, I think I was a little bit brave to do it myself. And here's why. Oh, boy, look, something I said. <laughs> it's the dog. It's the dog. We initiated into a fourth soon. That's right. It's the dog. Well, I'll go. I'll go ahead. Um, <clears throat> You know, one of the things that happened, uh, the risk I was willing to undertake, oh yeah, right. You know, they say never appear with kids and never appear with animals because you always look second best. That's right. Well, not to mention it's hard to, it's hard to keep the som somber tone with a little puff ball. <laughs> it is. Okay. Our, our listeners at home, a small, some sort of doodle has been brought on. Doodle. Yeah, but because I have allergies, people. I've, I'm highly sensitive. I've got allergies. I can't have any other kind of dog except for a very small poodle because it also has to be small because I travel a lot and I can't leave it at home by itself. So it's got to be able to go places with me. I mean, you know, there's a lot of requirements here. So yes, I and it also I almost didn't want it because its hair color matches me. I I'm like I'm one of those weird people that yeah. has a matching dog. It looks uh, so good with your hair. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, my mom's an interior designer, so we get pets that match the decor. Okay. Anyhow, I did hear what we were saying, and we were talking about it being a risky thing to. 
and and you were saying I was being overly serious too. I mean, I think that's in there. Uh, no, I wasn't saying that. I I think that's part of who you are, isn't it? I mean, you're also funny, and you've also given me a pep talk, which you know surprised me. Uh, you're not just one thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, from a farming point of view, by the way, that's that's not a dog. That's a plush toy, in hopes of being a dog, but. It'll probably work out, it sounds like. I completely forgot what I was going to say, but I think the gist of it was uh, that I think the undertaking that produced the book had a degree of uh, courage involved uh, on, on, on both sides. But uh, on my side, it was, you know, I had to occupy the position that uh, trying to trick myself out as relevant to someone as of Kimberly's generation uh, is a deeply disingenuous move to make. And I had, I had to hope somewhere in there that she would regard my failure to try to be relevant and easily translatable as, a, as an act of genuine uh, occupancy of the state of life that I'm in. And I think somewhere without ever identifying it or saying so, I think we got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the um, invitation into the mystery that you are offering through uh, the circuitous routes that you've taken me on today. I feel like just being together, the three of us, has been an experience in um, that, mi that mystery, that place of, of the I don't know and, and being okay in that place, of, or not okay, right, of the, of the we don't have all the answers and um, yeah, it felt like a, a Zen experience of sorts. Thank you guys. Do you want to have any last words, either of you? Well, I think that what you're saying about the mystery is, is part of it. And to me, you know, you describe it as a Zen experience. And I, I understand that because also every part of my language has to have come under the microscope of how I describe things and and not because I think it's wrong how I do it or you know that I'm trying not to be who I am or where I'm from or what my training has been but because encrusted in the word choice that we have some kind of common agreement about what that word choice means is also the worldview that got us to the place of a lot of suffering and the suffering that we're most people are feeling and, and even suffering is a weird word because you know if if anyone listening is into buddhism or hinduism it's like well yeah suffering suffering always happens and you know and so how do we get out of those coded phrases i mean it happens to me every single time when i'm teaching i say something and then someone says oh yeah nonviolent communication that's how you bring more understanding in community but there's something that's happening for me in the interaction and in the re reckoning because for me it is an ongoing reckoning it's not one time reckoning it's it's that the the person who's watering their lawn how do i not be the lawn waterer because it's easy where i live to forget about everything that's happening it's beautifully sunny and i can go along with my life sure the gas prices are a little bit higher and yeah, okay, maybe like inflation's happening, but how do I, without being tormenting myself or or becoming a personality that is not me, but how, if I want to be elder worthy or I want to be uh, true to the times, then for me, that's been, it has been very circuitous because there's no easy answer. There's no, and and there's no, it's not like my life's going to all of a sudden become immeasurably better. It's actually probably going to become a little worse because I'm not going to be the happy person at the party and I'm not going to have the, the great upside, you know, quip to, to get people off the hook for the thing that they know they shouldn't really be doing, but they're doing anyway. And then they're going to collaborate with each other to talk about doing it. So it's, it's an ongoing process that for me, we didn't, you know, you said you ha were having a lot of questions about death and we didn't get no. there specifically today, but 
there's plenty of koans about live each day like it's your last and, you know, contemplate your death and meditate on your death and all those things. But the way that this process has led me has just been something much more, all I can say is it's much more visceral and tangible and material world oriented. And I think there's a fundamental separation against the material world which is like why I didn't want to get a dog even though it might be a plush toy um you know all of these things that just are playing in the background that are disrupting my own spiritual process or my own um a f my own fear of my capacity my fear to interact with an older white man because I've had a guru before and does that mean I'm going to quote unquote give away my authority does that mean I'm going to forget what I know uh, be less myself um, how am I going to be judged in the process of people saying, oh, well, you usually talk to women, but all of a sudden things get hard and you go back to like the old guard. What's up with that? You know, um, all of the available interpretations that are just one step out there to grab. It's a pretty easy grab and it's happening all the time. Uh, but for me, it's really, it's been really important to me because of that underlying restlessness malaise that keeps showing me that there is something that's missing in the even if I was the most responsible spiritual smorgasbord consumer out there which I'm not in a competition but you know I was kind of trying uh it still just wasn't it, it it's not I don't know. It's so hard to even talk because then the words are like integrity. I mean, if I like the last week, the amount of times people have either talked to me about their authentic self or written to me about being their authentic self, I can barely hear it anymore because I'm like authentic self. There we are back at this crystallized individual and our whole life is just about being as pure as possible to reduce everything that might encroach upon our authenticity. And so my questions have just changed and are they're in the process of changing so i i'm still in the i don't know if i'm a puppy but i'm still in the growing period with trying to understand what kind of life choices come out of understanding the world a little differently it's very beautiful to watch you from afar continue to be so curious and open and I, I, I feel the same way. I don't feel like I have anything figured out and I like that. I want to keep just learning. And so I, I feel like today was a beautiful experience with you all of just being open to continually learning and updating ourselves and, um, Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm sure we'll put all the links to all your things in the show notes. And uh, it was a wonderful way to spend a rainy Virginia Sunday afternoon. So thank you guys for your time. Thank you for yours too. Thank you. I hope to see both of you in the human flesh form if, if it so be it in the future. <laughs> thank you all. big special thanks to Kevin Carlisle of Goodbye Gemini, who wrote this beautiful podcast music, and to DJ Juan Pablo Jimenez in southern Spain for mixing it and making it magic.